Podcast. Hello there, and welcome to a brand new episode of my podcast, Podcast Racing. Today on the podcast, I'm going to be talking about uh, favorite uh, guilty pleasure movies with a good friend of mine who actually hasn't been on the podcast yet. Uh, say hello to my good friend, Ben. How are you doing, Ben? I'm good. I'm very good. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Uh, still, you know, trying to be safe and all that. So uh, today we're going to be talking about favorite guilty pleasure movies, actually not just movies, shows, uh, and all that stuff. And, uh, but I want to ask you, there is no right or wrong answer to this question, but in your, uh, what is your definition of what a guilty pleasure is? I don't know. It's like, it's very ambiguous to me. A guilty pleasure um, for me is something that like by definite, by my standard like I think is kind of like corny cheesy and or bad but I but like I love it anyway like yeah. for reason for reasons that are personal to me I have a couple of movies in my list that like a lot of people think are like objectively good or like objectively bad but like I find good things and or bad things that like mix up into like a very enjoyable experience for me and that's why I, why I love them. Yeah my my definition of what a guilty pleasure is is basically your definition too it's something that I think uh is probably objectively bad but subjectively i still really enjoy it you know it might be a movie that has a lot of corny moments or just like bad filmmaking but i'm still like entertained by it or i enjoy it anyway and uh and and i i personally i know a lot of people would disagree with me but i don't think that there is such a thing as an objectively good movie but i think that that's a good thing i really i i think that you know film is uh cinema is great because not everybody's gonna have the same opinion on a certain film tv show whatever and we can uh hope well we can have um you know discussions uh over why we have one opinion and someone has the other opinion which i'm hoping will not lead to uh arguments uh and fights cough cough star wars cough cough <laughs> uh, warning i got a few i got like two star wars movies on my on my list you probably know you probably know what one of them is it's probably the same ones that are on my list uh which one of the star wars films are do you consider to be guilty pleasures okay one uh okay one i think is good even though everybody thinks it's bad and one uh, well most people like think it's like meh a second one it's like it's undebatably bad, but I love it <laughs> because of the the train wreck it is. The train wreck it is. It's uh, the holiday special. And <laughs> I know that was gonna make you upset. <laughs> but really? like, no, I mean, the only like the highlights of that I think are absolutely astounding to watch because you watch it and it's like, how did this happen? <laughs> and it makes me so, and it makes me laugh so hard. And I don't want to get on that that um too long because like the holiday special's been talked to uh, talked about to death. So um but yeah, I actually uh, you, thought that you were going to say Phantom Menace and Attack the Clones as your two guilty pleasures. I did not think you were going to bring up the holiday special at all. You know what? Um, now that I think about it, you, Phantom Menace was my first Star Wars experience. Well, no, not actually. It wasn't my first Star Wars experience in theaters because before that, Aaron Space Museum up in D.C. was showing, like, I think, Return of the Jedi or something so that might have been my first star wars experience in theaters but my like as far as like a new star wars movie that everybody went to watch and stuff like that phantom menace was my first so that might actually i might actually have to tack that on because that's a nostalgic trip for me there are a lot of good bad and good 
a lot of bad and good things about that. But um, I want to move on to my um, next Star Wars film. Sure. That, like, I've heard a lot of people kind of like Dog because it's a little fan service is Rogue One. I genuinely, like, enjoy the heck out of that movie. And I know a lot of people don't really, aren't really into it because it's more of a war drama. But that's, a, that's exactly what I was looking for <laughs> in, a Star, in a Star Wars movie. It, it's just, it's, it's a fascinating watch for me. That's interesting that you say Rogue One is a guilty pleasure because me personally, I think that Rogue One is actually really, has really great filmmaking. Like, I think that Rogue One is one of the best looking Star Wars movies. And I, I don't consider it to be, me personally, I don't consider it to be a guilty pleasure because I actually know quite a few people, including you, who really like that movie. And I do like it overall. And we've talked about this in our personal life, but just my personal issue, two big issues I have with Rogue One is that the characters are not as interesting as they could have been. And the first, like, hour of the movie is pretty slow. No, yeah, I totally agree with you, and I think that's, like, a good consensus of people that I've talked to about it don't, don't really enjoy it, but it's, I think, for me, it's all a good build-up. Uh, again, like you, like you said, the characters aren't too interesting, but that could debatably be because they weren't supposed to have any sort of life beyond the, uh, beyond the film that they are initially in. So, yeah, but I feel I like if know. the writers made, if the filmmakers made the characters more interesting, then their uh, spoilers for Rogue One, by the way, then their all their oh, bets yeah. at the end would have been made been so much more impactful to me. Like when all of them died at the end, I was like, oh, that's sad. But if I if they were more interesting and relatable characters, then I could have been almost possibly crying at the end of Rogue One. But I didn't cry because I wasn't truly invested in them in the first place i was just there because it's star wars yeah i can i can see that admittingly once you like got me with like aesthetic which that movie had it had the star wars aesthetic like it like you said it was one of the best looking star wars movies and it had a good soundtrack to to it who's the who's the name uh of the guy who does that soundtrack it's like michael, michael um, G he did michael the soundtrack G now. yes he did the soundtrack from law for lost which is where i initially know him from and then he also did the second new planet of the apes film i think that was rise of the planet of the apes was it it uh first one's rise the second one's dawn the third one is war he did dawn and he did a good job imitating the mood of that sort of soundtrack and he's very good at that while at the same time maintaining his own touch when it comes to like a soundtrack yeah, yeah. and I, um i i really like michael giacchino's music too i think well i personally know him more so from incredibles and up but yeah i also know that he did dawn and war and also Rogue One, and a great job in all of them. Yeah, he's very good. But that that movie gets the aesthetic of Star Wars, and that's really what that's really why I enjoy it um, because it's it looks great. Some of the acting in, in that isn't bad. Like you, admitting it, admittingly, like everybody debates over the Vader line, "Don't choke on your aspirations." I freaking love it because that's some cheesy sci-fi 70s corn that really captures the mood of that era of filmmaking and I'm like that belongs in there I know it's cheesy corny and debatably a bad line but it really that really belongs in there see I think see I'm not opposed to the lot to that line being in like a different Star Wars movie, but with Rogue One specifically, the majority of the movie was taken, like, so seriously, and it was, like, so dark, and like you said, it was a war drama, and then all of a sudden you hear Vader say, 
be careful not to choke on your aspirations. And a couple of people <laughs> in the theater, including my dad, were groans. We like a couple of people, including my dad, they were like, oh <laughs> I loved it. I thought it was great. But um because he's like, you know, he's the big villain of Star Wars, so he can say whatever he wants. <laughs> His, his scene his scene at the end though was amazing he's like chopping everybody up yeah oh. that's, that's, I mean if every uh, whether you like the film or not everybody um everybody agree I think who I've talked to about that scene agrees that that it's sick like yes, it's yes. awesome <laughs> yes everybody agrees that the Vader stuff at the end was awesome. But I, uh, I personally don't, wouldn't really consider uh, Rogue One to be a, uh, a guilty pleasure because the general consent, I know that there are some people who dislike it, but the general consensus of Rogue One is that, you know, it, it is a good, enjoyable Star Wars film. And, you know, I, I did enjoy it overall. I had issues with it, but I don't think it's a bad film. I do think that Phantom Menace and Attack of Clones are bad films, but I love watching them and rewatching them. I'd say, well, the thing is, is that like you can get me to rewatch the Phantom Menace because as bad as Phantom Menace is, it's not really all that boring. Like it has some good, exciting stuff in there. Attack of the Clones just kind of drags on. Yes, and it yes. drags on. I mean, you know, it's got some it's got some character to it, moments in it, but it's just like, can we skip this one? <laughs> when we're here, when we're watching them all in a row, can we just skip over this one, please? It, it, you know, it's, it's, I I would have to disagree with people that say that, uh, like you you should skip Phantom Menace entirely when we watching like the when watching the entire saga because. There are some, cru I mean, there are some crucial mo plot moments in Phantom Menace, and especially Attack of Clones, even if the overall films are not good. I know, I, I get it. And I watch Attack of the Clones out of respect for Christopher Lee, <laughs> but that's the only thing that really ties me to it. <laughs> Dooku is such a boring character, though. Like, I feel bad for Christopher Lee a little bit, because he played such a boring character. He had one interesting line is where um, he said, um, I wish Obi-Wan were here right now. I could really use his help because it really implies that he got way too deep into this whole dark side stuff and he needs help out of it and he could use a good friend to get him out of it. And that gives him some really interesting character dynamic, but beyond that line, it doesn't ever get brought up again. I, that 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 could be interesting if it was fleshed out more, and I'm a little surprised that they didn't flesh that out more in Clone Wars. They decided to just keep making Dooku like a big old baddie. No, but, yeah, like like out of the little I've seen from Clone Wars, uh, they just kept diving, doubling down on him being a very bad character and they didn't really flesh out like that little nit bit of character like actual dynamic character that he had i i think clone wars overall is a really great show but i do wish that in clone wars the concepts of dooku and grievous are interesting but clone wars never really uh, built up on their characters. They just showed up in Clone Wars to continue to be, you know, big old bad guys. And 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 you can tell that they were they cared so much more and did a great job in fleshing out Obi Wan and Anakin in the Clone Wars show, especially in the final season. I won't spoil anything, but that final season of Clone Wars, oh my gosh! I've heard, I've heard some good things. Oh, uh, brilliant! Um, I'm not. I I don't know whether it will like resonate with me or not because I'm not I haven't really caught up on any of the Clone Wars at all like I never really got into it so even if I watch the last season I'm not really sure if it will like really resonate with me all of what's brought up to that point in what everybody's gotten excited about do you like or love Revenge of the Sith 
Um, yeah, I'm I'm good with it. Uh, I I like it all right. You know what? That actually should have been on my guilty pleasures list because that is, like out of it's the best in my opinion. It's it's hard to say that that's the best out of the prequel trilogy. I it think is it's one of the it, it, it's a messy film and it also has bad CGI, but that is the best out of the prequel trilogy. Some good memes came out of that one. Like there's yeah. some good like, there's some good memes that came out of that one. I think that's why it's kind of like the prequel trilogy has really gra- rooted itself in pop culture as time's gone by because of the memes, and everybody just enjoys it for that. It's one of the main reasons I still enjoy the prequel trilogies is because it's just so funny. <laughs> yeah, well, I well I I was able to find a newfound appreciation for the prequel trilogy overall because of the Clone Wars and the final season especially of the Clone Wars leads directly into Revenge of the Sith in such a without spoiling anything it the final season Clone Wars literally the final episode of Clone Wars leads directly into the events of Revenge of the Sith in such a clever uh, way and uh, emotional way and and I'm not going to say anything beyond that but I, I mean, I'm not saying you have to watch the final season of Clone Wars. I'm just saying that it leads directly into Revenge of Sith and uh, makes that movie a little bit, what happens in that movie, a little bit more impactful. I'll try, I'll try and check it out at some point. Before this ends up becoming, like, a big, a big Star Wars podcast episode, we should, like, move on, maybe. Yeah, no, um, I was about to say the same thing. Do you have any um, other, uh, do you have any other, uh, like guilty pleasure movie show whatever oh yeah i got i got a whole list of them unless you wanted to name off one of yours you you can go first the village by m night Shyamalan. actually I that's see. a that's a guilty pleasure of mine <laughs> and it's because i don't know why but creepy pilgrim era movies really like um i really like the whole like look of that sort of thing. And that really sucks me in. The the and village that, and, was shot the village was shot by Roger Deakins, who is, in my opinion, the greatest living cinematographer of all time. He also shot uh Blade Runner 2049, No Country for Old Men, uh majority of the Coen Brothers films, 1917. His films always look great, and I think the village the village has its issues for sure, but I think that the village looked great. One of the reasons why I think think like I like it, even though it has the twist, like a lot of people say like that twist, it happens way too early. And I get I think I kinda get what M Knight was going for. He wanted to make his audience question the truth of what they know like later because spoiler alert i don't know if anybody's gonna watch the book but it turns out that the monsters are fake that they use monsters to key it they use these monster legends to like keep the villagers from ever leaving outside the borders and becoming part of normal society because you know lack of materialism is supposed to like you know keep everybody happy and stuff like that so they kind of like they kind of like keep everybody closed out from the outside world to keep them happy i don't know but that gets revealed very that gets revealed very early and but a monster ends up showing later and we're also and i'm guessing what m night was going for was kind of like we're supposed to know that these things aren't real but what is one doing here right now if that's true. Yeah, I think M. Night, my, my issue with M. Night Shyamalan is that he has a lot of great ideas. Like, George Lucas in the prequel trilogy, there were a lot of great ideas in the prequel trilogy. M. Night Shyamalan in all of his movies has great ideas, but neither filmmaker just execute that, executes them that well. Like, like even in the original Star Wars trilogy, I, I, again, going back to Star Wars for just a brief moment, even in the original Star Wars trilogy, there were a lot of uh, corny moments, but the good stuff was executed really well. 
And I, I just, I don't think that, M, I get what M. Night was going for in the village, but I just don't think that he executed it. It just came off as cheesy and pretentious and unintentionally funny at times. I know, and Walking Phoenix, uh, Walking Phoenix is, from what I understand, uh, actually a good actor, with, which is like, um, he's been in two M. Night movies, and in both, he's kind of like, meh. I don't know if that's kind of, that, that might be a problem on M. Night's part, part not being really good with, like, actors, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I Yeah, I think that M. Night... M. Night gets a lot of actors who are really good overall, but he, I, I, I just, he, like, I think he struggles to really communicate to them what he wants them to portray on screen, and then they end up portraying it in a way that he wasn't imagining. Like, you're like, Joaquin Phoenix is a great actor, and he was amazing in Joker, Walk the Line, Gladiator. Joaquin Phoenix is a great actor, but, and Bruce Willis it can be good. Samuel L. Jackson can be good, just not necessarily in M. Night's films, specifically. Well, from what I hear, modern-day um, Bruce Willis is kind of a diva, so that yeah. debating it is, like, depending on what era you're talking about um, with Bruce Willis, <laughs> Yeah, that can, yeah. Mean, that can mean a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, but, no, like, I... I think that yeah no I'm I'm talking I when I'm uh, when I was talking about good Bruce Willis I was mostly referring to his time in like Die Hard and like earlier films. I know yeah I get you modern day Bruce Willis is like I don't know what's going on with that. Yeah. Um, but speaking of speaking of that night like Signs is also on my list but I think I'd say the same thing about that as I do the Village, and like you said good ideas. Not really executed all that well. Most of their time is um, spent in front of the television just kind of speculating things. And with trying to make sense out of the aliens kind of like motivations is like impossible, is like nearly impossible. When you start thinking about everything that's going on in that film like if you don't think about it about it, it it's kind of it's kind of good like there's something there but then when you really try to like think about like char character or like um, monster motivation in that film you're kind of like this doesn't make any sense <laughs> you yeah know it, just, it just kind of feels like the aliens and signs just kind of improvised along the way like now we're gonna like we have no idea what we're doing but now we're just gonna be spontaneous or whatever. Yeah, so they, it kind of like the way they go about everything kind of just makes them look like intergalactic pranksters. Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, no, that is a perfect way to describe the aliens and signs, intergalactic pranksters. <laughs> like they're just running around ruining kids' birthday parties and like pissing off farmers. <laughs> <laughs> and that's it. <laughs> I I want to um uh I want to bring up a couple of uh, guilty pleasure movies that share mm. one thing in common: the uh, legend himself, Nicolas Cage. Well, oh, yeah, <laughs> a majority of Nicolas Cage's movies are guilt are guilty pleasures, but that's because of how so amazingly over the top he is. Oh, if you're if you're gonna bring up, I I hope you bring up one. Be, because if it is, it's also on my list. But continue. <laughs> uh, well, now there were there were so many Nicolas Cage movies to choose from, but the two that I personally revisit the most is uh, two called Ghost Rider, and the other is The Wicker Man. Oh dang! Yeah, you, you got close. Mine was Face Off. <laughs> yeah, I see. Well, see, Face Off. Like, I think Face Off has a lot more good than bad. But but uh, there is some amazingly bad stuff in it. Like Nicolas Cage and John Travolta both are so over the top in that movie. Like so uh, much. But that's another one. If you think about it too hard, then it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but anyway, back to Wicker Man. What was the other one? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh. Well, I'll. I'll talk about Ghost Story later, but Wicker Man. I mean, not Ghost Story. Ghost, Ghost Rider. Rider. 
Ghost Rider. Oh my, uh, Wicker Man. Oh my gosh. So for those of you who don't, great. <laughs> for those of you who don't know, Wicker Man is uh, was originally a film from the seventies. That uh, it's a horror film about. A uh, police detective who investigates a, a murder on this uh, island that you know that has this very like religious cult-like community. It deals a lot with like like theism versus um, like atheism, and deals very heavily in like religion. And it it all it actually the original Wicker Man from the seventies actually also uh, features uh, Christopher Lee in it as the main like bad guy leader of this cultish religious community. And uh, it's a very creepy, uh, disturbing movie. The remake with Nicolas Cage, however, it's, uh, it has a similar plot, but it's just so funny. Not once was I ever, well, a couple times maybe I was disturbed by how far Nicolas Cage was going with wearing that bear suit and punching old, uh, punching old ladies, but... That movie just, most of that movie is just so funny, especially the the comedic highlight <laughs> is definitely the bees, though. Oh yeah, when they put the bee, when they put the bee, um, the helmet on him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it just goes ah, that the bees. Uh, yeah, that that's one. Of, that was, I think, when a lot a lot of the internet rediscovered that movie. That that was a good meme for a good long while. But it's a funny thing. It's a funny thing you brought up the original movie because I was, I haven't seen it. So I was going to actually ask how that held up, but you also mentioned Christopher Lee was in it. And um, now I'm like, now I got to watch it because out of respect for Christopher Lee. <laughs> I got to warn you though, that the original Wicker Man movie is like really like disturbing. Like there's some, there's some uh, scenes in that movie where I'm like, how did this even get past like the, uh, sensors and ratings board and all that. So I got to warn you, the original Wicker Man does have some very creepy and disturbing moments. Gotcha. Um, but the but remake, oh my gosh. Modern day Wicker Man is awesome. Um, for all the wrong reasons. <laughs> I, I love that movie so much. It's good. Um, for as a, as a cheese, as a corn cheese Nicolas Cage movie. I haven't watched it in a while, but I do remember, do remember some good highlights from that movie like the weird I, I still don't get what was supposed to be in that bag that was wriggling around where he's like what's in the bag a shark or something I still don't understand what was supposed to be in that bag <laughs> was it, it, it was um they didn't make it super clear but it was like a chopped up like a uh, person that was going to uh like tell Nicolas Cage about what was really going on on the island Oh, it was a chopped up person. And Why if would... it was one of the old ladies that claimed to like chop him up into pieces. And I'm like, lady, you're like 80 years old. How did you do that? <laughs> I don't get why they would like keep him alive wriggling around in the bag like that. That doesn't make any sense. <laughs> it, 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 it doesn't make it, it like nothing in that movie makes any sense. <laughs> <laughs> like and and also like the the bees like it's you can tell that the bees are like cgi and and also like how did you get the bees in there in the first place and how do you pour them in like wouldn't they tell don't bees fly wouldn't they just fly right out and i assume that they would get mad at the people for trapping them in that bag in the first place so wouldn't they just fly out fly not a uh, fly right back to the people and just sting them instead of Nicolas Cage like what okay. I don't recall how they do it but um you're the way you make it out they just kind of like pour it they literally any, had like, a bag connecting. full of bees like a like they had a leather bag and they just poured the bees into the helmet thing and Bees can fly. They could just fl they could just fly right out of the bag. There was a ton of space in between the bag and the helmet. Yeah, so, like they could just fly it out towards the people that trapped them in that bag and just sting them instead of stinging Nicolas Cage. Like, yeah, well, my so experience... much like so much dumb, broken logic. No logic. In my experience with bees, that's not how bees work. <laughs> they don't. They don't pour like water. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they exactly, exactly. But uh, I know that this one, 
a lot of uh, I know that this one a lot of people just consider to be just bad and not laughably bad, but I I, I don't know. Just Ghost Rider is a terrible movie, but I just have a lot of fun watching that movie because of course, well there aren't as many like over the top Nicolas Cage moments, but the few that there are are great. And I and also the stuff with the villains, like the devil's son and all that stuff, they play that stuff like so like seriously that but it comes off as unintentionally. Like most of the unintentionally funny moments in Ghost Rider aren't actually with Nicolas Cage himself, but with the villains who like, the filmmakers actually tried to portray them as, like, really, like, intimidating, uh, scary villains, but they just come off as children who are dressed in heavy makeup and scary costumes who are trying to act scary. And it just they, comes off as funny. They really just come off as, like, tw um, Twilight character rejects. Yeah, and it, well, and it <laughs> came out before Twilight, so, oh. Yeah. Oh, it did? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. That's really funny. I thought I I, I kind of lose track around that era of um, of movies of what came first because uh, because it all kind of like blurs for it's all kind of a blur to me <laughs> that the, era the early, of film. The early two thousands, especially in superhero movies, that was a weird like time for movies and superhero slash action movies specifically. Beside because. With the exception of uh, Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy, these films had like serious themes, moments, all that stuff in it, but the filmmaking wouldn't reflect the seriousness of the tone that they're trying to go for. The filmmaking would be like, oh, cool, backflips and, and uh, three, uh, 360 camera turns and CGI all over the place and all that. Like besides the Dark Knight trilogy, superhero movies and action movies in the early 2000s were corny at, were simultaneously corny and cheesy as hell but also pretentious and taking itself way too seriously well you you could also say that like the x-men films were pretty good i'm not a big fan of brian singer these days for reasons yeah uh yeah let's get away from that anyway <laughs> but those, those were pretty good the that and the dark knight trilogy were like the only really like notable things going on for superhero movies. I'm amazed that uh, Warner Brothers in 2004 released the awful Halle Berry Catwoman movie, and then one year later released Batman Begins, and those are two completely different movies. I think they they just wanted to like make people forget about that as much as they possibly could. It's like. Get the, we need new Batman stuff out before people like, you know, like latch this on to us. <laughs> well, what's crazier about that is that they actually started planning both of those movies around the same time, like around the same time, like around the same, uh, like Halle Berry signed up for the Catwoman movie around the same time that Christian Bale and Christopher Nolan uh, agreed to be in the Batman Begins reboot. So, like, that, that, so the fact that, like, Warner Brothers, like, approved both of these... Oh, that's it's crazy. So, it's so, like, around the same time, it's so, like, crazy to me. Maybe they were just gonna go, like, um, see which one ended up being more popular and just continue on with that. <laughs> I don't know, but, like, if it was an experiment, if it was an experiment, I imagine it was a very expensive experiment because then wasn't the budget for Catwoman, like, Four billion. I thought it was like something around. It, it, I I heard it from what I heard. It was pretty high. The the me... highest the highest movie budget ever is uh, Avengers Endgame, but that was three hundred and fifty million. I don't. There's oh, okay. no movie in existence. Yeah, I was about to say that costs four billion dollars. I was I was about to say I was gonna throw an outrageous number out there, and um, if you can it was outrageous it, though, like Catwoman cost 150 million and i think batman begins cost like 130 million or something like that yeah but, but like view viewers you can't see me looking at the camera right now but look up everything i say because <laughs> i throw out stuff in there that like 
I got you. And I throw out, I I can throw out some stupid inf- misinformation a lot of times. Don't take my word as gospel, for goodness sakes. <laughs> no, you're you're good, man. You're good. Yeah, I don't I don't go always go into these uh, podcasts knowing everything or being fully prepared either. But I want to go back to uh, M Night Shyamalan real quick and bring up another movie of his that's. A, uh, a lot of people love, but all for all the wrong reasons. The happening. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, that one. I, oh my gosh! I I know that beginning is supposed to be disturbing, but me and my friends back in high school, being the edgy teenagers we were, as soon as everybody was jumping off that building, we laughed our butts off because we were stupid edgy teenagers. <laughs> And then it was just, it was just more hilarity from then on out. (laughs) Oh my gosh, just, how did a single scene from that movie get approved by the filmmakers, the actors, the studio, the producers, all of them, and be included in a movie that was shipped to at least like 2,000 theaters nationwide? How? I, like, there was a lot of hype built up from M- with M. Night Shyamalan for a good long while. Everybody was saying, like, oh, this kid, this guy's going to be the next Alfred Hitchcock and stuff like that. And I think this was supposed to kind of be his version of, like, the birds. But, you know, this, that just kind of fell flat on his face, <laughs> you know. Really flat. You, he was trying to get a very mundane thing that nobody's scared of and make it scary. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. It, which is always an interesting experiment, but in this case, it was like, especially because of the acting. Especially because of the acting. <laughs> what was Zoe Deschanel doing in that movie? Just I don't know. her with her big eyes and just speaking like this and just saying how there's evil everywhere in the world like she talked like that and it was like what are you doing like zoe were you on drugs the whole i mean i mean hey like maybe m night was like maybe zoe was like okay this m night guy clearly doesn't know what he's doing i'm just gonna i'm just gonna uh not even try or i'm just gonna be on drugs all the time maybe that was zoe's mindset you know just kind of like you know wing your way through it i mean i don't know how it like, if M. Night is as good as the hype made him out to be, I don't know how any of that got past him, unless, you know, all the hype was just kind of, like, you know, hype. But, like, it's... I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Everything about that movie kind of, like, went wrong. Like I said, getting something that is mundane and not scary and trying to make it scary is an interesting thing to try and do. Yeah, but like it's it didn't work work here because of a lot of reasons. Oh my like, gosh! Yeah, it really it really did not work. And, it, okay, and it's you go ahead. Okay, it's like I, I I think it goes a lot to my theory is what I said before is like that M Night probably maybe isn't good with actors, but that's you know just that's just me speculating. I don't know. <laughs> the, that's just big speculation for me. Uh, amazingly, though, the happening, as messy and as awful as the happening is, that's not his worst movie. Cough, cough, last airbender, cough, cough. Oh, yeah. The only highlight I can get from that movie is when, like, the ground airbend, when the earth benders are, like, you know. And oh, my gosh, there. there's six of them doing that choreographed dance, and then like, there's one rock. Yeah, it just, like, wobbles around. <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> and the and Aang spe- and Aang or Ong speech of the ground is uh, a symbol of who you are. <laughs> it's just so uh, How did how did these how did the Fire Nation trap earthbenders in a prison that's literally made out of earth? How? I don't know. From what I hear, because I haven't seen the whole um, last Airbender series, but from what I understand, the Earthbenders are debatably supposed to be the strongest of all the benders, uh, of the bending elements. Like, they do some wicked, wicked stuff with their power. But 
like <laughs> in the movie it's just like i that part kills me every time when they do that hua 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 and then wobble 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 rock <laughs> <laughs> that that just kills me every time I see it. You can you can tell that M Night is not good with choreographing action scenes at all. Because even though um, Unbreakable and Glass are movies about superheroes, the uh, like there really isn't like there is fighting in those movies, but it's not like filmed in a real like cinematic way. And even though Signs is a movie about aliens, like the, the final like confrontation between Mel Gibson, Joaquin Phoenix, and the aliens. It's, like, purposely filmed very, like, slowly and deliberately. Like, that's M. Night's style, is he's a very, he, he, he's uh, purposely has a very slow pacing. He's very deliberate in his delivery of certain things. Avatar The Last Airbender is a super fast-paced show, and uh, it's an action show, um, martial arts show, and all of that stuff. And, like, the fact that Nickelodeon and Paramount Pictures even hired M. Night in the first place to make the last Airbender movie. His style is the exact opposite of the show's style. So, like, ugh. You know what? You may have something going there because maybe that's why M. Night just doesn't do well these days is because he keeps trying to reach out of his element. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, he, he did try, he did kind of go back to his quote-unquote roots with the uh, visit and the uh, split and you know v visit and split weren't perfect but i thought that they were not they weren't great films but they were kind of a return to form but then m night Shyamalan got too ambitious again for uh glass and he kind of fell flat on his face again yeah i mean visit just kind of like they were just like I was kind of like, uh, like a found footage movie, M. Night, come on. Everybody's kind of like tired of these. So I don't even know why he thought that was a good idea. I'm going to bring up uh, another guilty pleasure of mine, and you might not consider this to be a guilty pleasure because there actually, I do think that there is much more good in this movie than bad, but the bad in this movie I'm about to mention really sticks out. Spider-Man 3 with Tobey Maguire. <laughs> you know what? Um, I love that because, like, um, him doing the Saturday night strut down the street oh. is, like, the greatest thing ever. <laughs> that, that's, that's, not even, that's not even the funniest scene. That's the most memeable scene in the whole movie, but the funniest unintentionally funny scene in the whole movie is when he's at that uh, club, restaurant, wherever, where uh, Kirsten Dunst, MJ, is working at. And then he just uh, just storms in there with his eyelashes and black hair. And then he oh, starts but... dancing. And then he's like, now take on this. And then he's like snapping. Oh, yeah. But... That, that stupid like dance thing. That was, that was the funniest scene. Mm -hmm. I mean, Sam Raimi, that's kind of in Sam Raimi's sort of style because he goes, he, he, he likes to put elements of himself in there. If you recall to like Spider-Man 2, like Spider-Man 2, there's a moment in there where like, you know, they're about to do surgery to remove Doc Ock's like, you know, tentacle, um, tentacles. And they just start going, uh, like, all over the place and stuff like that. That whole scene just screams Sam Raimi style. Yeah, it, but, it, but, uh, scene, but there's a big difference between the uh, horror hospital scene in Spider-Man 2 and the dance scene in Spider-Man 3. I know, like, it's just... Like, there's, there's, two, there's a big difference between those two scenes. The scene in Spider-Man 2 is actually really well filmed and terrifying. And the scene in Spider-Man 3 is just goofy and unnecessary to the story. Yeah, I, I think the point, I, I think my point is that, like, it's just kind of like his MO to go into, like, very cheesy territory like that. Because he does it with, like, Evil Dead and, like, in other, in, like, other films he's done. Um, in other aspects, though. But like he, he, like he doesn't shy away from getting corny on purpose, is what I'm saying. 
And I, I like that about uh, his Spider-Man films. You know, like, I, I think that, yes, there are corny and cheesy moments in Spider-Man 1 and 2, but for the most part, the moments in those movies that are cheesy and corny actually are integrated well with uh, the story and the world in which, you know, the Spider-Man film takes place. And a couple of those moments are actually integral to the plot, whereas the corny and cheesy moments in Spider-Man 3 don't, are not necessary to apply and just feel way too, like, out of place for me. They, they kind of do. I think he was really trying to really get across the point, oh, Peter's acting like a big jerk because of the suit. Because it, um, I don't know if, like, like any, if anybody is, like, understands the Venom suit or anything like that, but it's, a, it's, itself is an alien living being that latches onto you and like affects you um so i think he was really trying to get that point across and he might have gone into it a little too hard yeah it, yeah i i i think so but but there were but i do think that overall there's more good in spider-man 3 than bad like everything with uh sandman Everything with MJ, everything Air with Man. MJ, everything with Tobey Maguire before he's infected with the Venom symbiote. There's a lot in Spider-Man 3 that's really good. And in fact, I've rewatched many times on YouTube the scene where uh, Black Suit Spider-Man and Sandman fight uh, in the train station. I think that scene is awesome. Oh, yeah. For me, that point where he just says "good riddance" really gets a point gets across the point well that the yeah. suit's affecting him. You didn't need all that Saturday Night Strut Club scene and all that. You, you're definitely right on the fact that it really deviates away from the story. Yeah, like I think that the "good riddance" line actually adds to how far, like how downward, like how far Peter Parker has fallen. I don't know, maybe it was really trying to imply that it's like, it's not just him as Spider-Man, it's him in his regular life, too. Again, maybe, like, just went too deep in. Like, he he really, like, charged forward with that and didn't really, and kind of, like, you're right, all, you are right that all that really distracts from the overall film, but, like, you know, I I think he intended it for a reason. It, should, it, it is it is uh, partially Sony's fault though, because because Sony forced uh, Sam Raimi to put Venom in Spider Man Three. No, yeah, I was about to say it's like because they really they really wanted to put more villains in there. I I heard about Sony like really trying, like, telling him that he needed to shoehorn Venom into there, and it was all right, I guess, but it, it kind of like unbalanced a lot of things. Yeah, yeah. But uh, speaking of Spider-Man, though, do you think that we keep hearing reports of how Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield are going to be in the Tom Holland Spider-Man 3? Do you think that that's actually true, or do you think that Kevin Feige and Marvel are just trolling us? I don't know, man. I I haven't caught up with a lot of Marvel new, news these days. I I think that'd be, uh, they were supposed to be in Into the Spider-Verse, from what I heard, but they kind of, like, they kind of cut that idea. They did bring back J.K. Simmings, so I don't think it's out of the realm of impossibility that they would bring back past Spider-Man actors. Without spoiling anything, in, the, in uh, WandaVision, they bring back uh, someone from Age of Ultron that's, you, that, like, blew my mind. Oh. Uh, yeah, without without spoiling anything, they brought someone back from Age of Ultron in WandaVision, and when he showed up, I was like, what? I think I think I might know what the who it is, but I uh, I won't get into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, just in case just in case, yeah. I, I, I hope I didn't uh spoil it for you too much and I definitely don't want to spoil it for anyone else. Uh, who hasn't seen WandaVision yet, but uh, do you have any other uh, guilty pleasures on your list that you want to talk about? I do. Um, you know what, next one, I'll just dive right into this one. Dune. The David the, Lynch film? Yeah, the David Lynch film. 
and it's mostly because I enjoy the look of that film. It's just so weird looking. I hate the fact that it's not a good film. <laughs> I, I really do, because, I, because it looks great, and I want it to be good. <laughs> I, it was it was on a good level of weird that I think fit the story, <laughs> and but the then the acting was just all weird and wooden and you know they're trying to condense a story that should have been split into two movies into one film, and I I just don't think it works. To be fair, the novel is isn't exactly the like most like, like the novel is influential uh, for a, a reason and it's high regarded for a reason. But the novel has issues too in terms of like how the world is built, uh, revealing a couple of things too early. And I, I think that that novel is very hard to adapt. And I'm really uh, interested to see how Denis Villeneuve. Uh, whoever he pronounced his name, uh, bring, uh, how he adapted it for the upcoming uh, Dune remake. But I think I don't. I think that David Lynch, I think that he did the best that he could. And but, but yeah, I I agree. The his Dune movie is very convoluted and dull, and they like put like too much stuff in. And I think that Denis is going a bit of a smarter route, where he said that. The, the movie will only be the first half of the book. And he said that he, he confirmed that he's going to kind of restructure the plot line of the book uh, a little differently for the movie. That'd be good. Um, I would, I'd hope they don't force him into like making it a trilogy, you know, with The Hobbit. I thought that would make a good two film series, but you know how Hollywood likes their trilogies. So they kind of forced Peter Jackson to splitting down to three films, which I, I think was a little much. You don't need three films for that book. And I think it's the same thing with Dune. I think that would be a good two part story, a two part movie. Well, actually, um, I'm not sure if this is true or not, but what, from what I've heard is that I heard that Warner Brothers originally just uh, hired Denis to make one movie based off the book, but then Denis, it was actually Denis's idea to split it into, like, two movies. Uh, if, they did, if, if they do it in one film, that's going to be hard. That's going to yeah, be yeah. very hard. Yeah. Um, fingers crossed. Hopes and prayers. It's going to end up <laughs> being good. Um, I mean, the trailer, w the trailer made it look at least, like, visually, like, spectacular. Yeah. Um, I, I, um, going a little bit on that trailer I did see it it made it kind of gave me a like sort of like young adult movie vibe for for some reason the look it, it looks like the setting and the costume design looks awesome but like it was really it felt really portrayed in a um sort of young adultish way that kind of reminded me of like the whole Hunger Games Maze Runner sort of era well, even from the trailer alone, gonna, in my opinion, this film looks so much better than Hunger Games and Maze Runner. No, yeah, it definitely does. And, I, and I'll and i admit, um, on a cinematic level, it looks better than David Lynch's film. It's just that, like, I'm very attached to, like, it's like the weirdness of David Lynch's film, I think, really fits the story. Because... It's a it's a very weird story, and I think that has a lot to do with the fact that, like, I, you know, take this for what you will, but I think Frank Herbert, when he wrote that book, might have been like, he might have been taking some drugs for inspiration. I wouldn't doubt it. <laughs> oh no, he definitely was. Yeah, he definitely was uh, on some kind of substance uh, when uh, when he was writing that book for sure. Here's the thing. I know, that, like. Uh, the the writing style, like you said, there are some issues with the book, and one of the one of the issues with me was like the writing style, kind of like was in the mind of every of every single character. So like yeah. you get a very big spoiler at the very beginning of the book, and the, and halfway through it, I was even like, I can't, I can't do this. Uh, I mean, at least there is a big spoiler. And at least David Lynch knew to not reveal that too early. He kind of insinuates it at a, at a few parts, but you kind of like, you know, 
you, you're it's kind of like a mystery of like who is it well i'm well here's the hoping that the new dude movie is really good and and i don't i actually don't think that the david lynch dude movie i don't think that it's like horrible i just think that it's really messy it is and like i said i wish it wasn't a, i wish it wasn't a hot mess because it has it has a lot of there's a lot of potential there <laughs> I, I've seen way worse movies, though, than David Lynch's Dune movie, though. There you go. Uh, I, I have two, but, like, it's a, it's a shame. Uh, and I, I think um, David Lynch even knew that he was kind of, like, that he, at some point, because, like, I did see, like, some, I think I did, at one point I saw the behind the scenes for that movie, or found the behind the scenes of that movie where he's quoted as saying, like, I think I'm on a sinking ship uh, as in regards to that movie. And I'm like, oh, damn. <laughs> like, like George Lucas infamously said, I may have gone too far in a few places. Oh, uh, yeah. That's the, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard George Lucas say. Yeah. <laughs> like, you think, damn it, you think? Yeah. Uh, but, um... Yeah, uh, like you said, I think David Lynch did the best he could because I think from what I understand, it was a project that had been in the works for a while. Like um, it was, it, it was supposed to be this big, ambitious sort of like cult animation film where you had like uh, I I can't remember the director's name. J it starts with the J Jakovsky or something. Andre, but, uh, Andre Jordakovsky, I think. There you go. I think that's it. But he had, like, this huge, ambitious project for Dune. He got, like, Orson Welles to get be a part of it, and he, he apparently signed away a whole buffet for him personally to be a part of it. He also wanted to do it in, in a total, totally animated with concepts from, with concept art from H.R. Geiger and all kinds of like just throwing all kinds of money at it. And of course it never got, uh, it never, it never really got off the ground because it started becoming too expensive. But that, you, you should look into that because that is quite a rabbit hole of, uh, of, that is, in general, that is quite a rabbit hole, and my explanation probably won't do it justice, <laughs> but it's an interesting thing. And yeah, I, think, I, I have heard little bits and pieces here and there about Jordakovsky, Jordorovsky's uh, Dune, uh, Dune project, but I don't know the full story, But so maybe I will uh, look into it. Do you have any more uh, like guilty pleasures that you want to name off? This probably isn't even a bad movie. But it's so corny and so cheesy. But it was debatably made for kids. So I might be going into, like, you know, touchy territory with this. But Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. <laughs> you would, really? You would consider Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets a guilty pleasure, huh? Yeah, exactly. I, I don't think it has, like, it has a... I don't know if it has a right being on this list. Because it's like, it's... It's debatably, it's debatably good, but it's just like, it's, it's so corny, but it's a fun romp, and I love it. I, but, mean, um, I mean, I, I, I enjoy uh, many moments in that movie. Like, overall, I do think it is, you know, corny and uh, messy, but, and I do think that it is one of the weaker Harry Potter films, but I wouldn't call it, you know, a bad movie. Nah, you know what? I kind of wouldn't either, in fact... You might want to skip over this one, but like, just to talk about it, just to talk about it a little, it's one of those movies that I just love poking out at. Like, deep down inside, I genuinely enjoy Chamber of Secrets, but it, there's just so much to like, you know, poke fun at in regards to that movie. Yeah, I, I, I guess. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't really remember. Like, yeah, I, I, I guess like one moment that I think is ridiculous in Chamber of Secrets is that Lucius Malfoy literally was about to Avada Kedavra Harry right outside Dumbledore's office and with Dumbledore right on the other side, like right in his office still. Like, Lucius Malfoy, what are you doing? You're going to try to kill Harry? 
right out yeah, the ex- master of Hogwarts' office. Exactly. It's like, what the heck are you doing, man? <laughs> and and, and was, even Dumbledore in that entire movie is just so irresponsible. Dumbledore is uh, debatably irresponsible throughout the whole series. He's hey, kind of, but he, he was awesome in Order of the Phoenix, though. That duel with him and Voldemort was awesome. I don't know. Maybe it's because he, like, he was very hands off because of the whole prophecy thing. So he just was kind of like, you know, I'm not too worried about it, whatever, <laughs> because this is all going to sort itself out. He doesn't really see. He kind of gives that um, whole like sort of vibe of like, oh, I'm I'm doing more than you. Uh, I'm doing more than you could possibly think, but it really just comes off as him being lazy. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> even in the but, books, even the book, even in the books, at times he just comes off as lazy and like, oh, it, things will work out on its own. Yeah, but um, maybe we should move on from this because even when I put this one on my list, I was kind of like, eh, I don't know if this really counts. Yeah, but uh, I, I thought I'd, I thought I'd bring it up anyway. But do you well, have one anything? Last, one last uh, guilty pleasure that I want to bring up is uh, not necessarily a specific uh, movie or show, but that I, I these are like a lot of the Disney Channel original movies, shows, Nickelodeon shows, all Cartoon Network, all that. A lot of them are bad, but I enjoy revisiting them on like Disney Plus. Or when I used to have a CBS All Access for nostalgia's sake, like oh, yeah. like Danny fan like uh, stuff like Danny. Well, there's objectively great stuff like Av- not Avatar: Last Airbender, early SpongeBob. Uh, some of the newer Disney Channel stuff is objectively great, like Gravity Falls. But there's also stuff like Big Time Rush or like Danny <laughs> Phantom, stuff like that. Is like it's not very good, but. I remember having a fondness for this as a kid, so, like, I revisit it, and I think, I watch it, I'm like, oh, this isn't good, but I enjoy having fun because of nostalgia. Oh, no, yeah, uh, there are a lot of things like that for me, like I was saying earlier, Phantom Menace, which should have been on this list, of the, um, like, you you brought it up, I, I should have brought that up on my list as well as my Star Wars film. The only reason why I like, um, holiday special is because of how angry Star Wars fans get over it on a but honestly like um because Phantom Menace was my first Star Wars experience uh in theaters that's why it has a special place in my heart for nostalgia so I totally get what you're saying with like all those shows uh, shows I think I got a couple of shows that are like that too I can't think of them at the moment though yeah, yeah, I, yeah. These, these shows are like objectively like really like they're definitely like I was like me as a twenty five year old. I was definitely not the intended demographic for a lot for a lot of these shows. Uh, but 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 I watched them uh, for from uh, an age when I was the intended demographic, and I enjoyed them at that age, and I still kind of enjoy them now, but. Not really because I'm enjoying the show, but because I'm watching the show, and then I remember enjoying it from when I was a kid. So, yeah, so, like, older, like, Disney Channel and Nickelodeon shows. But I want to start uh, wrapping things up, so do you have any uh, final uh, guilty pleasures that you want to talk about? All right. Uh, I'll bring up one. I'll bring up a big one, and I don't know if you ever heard about this one. I, I rediscovered this. Because um, I watched it, I I watched it as a kid, and I remember it being the most boring thing ever. And then I found it on free for YouTube again. It was um, Hallmark's Dinotopia. What? I don't know if you, Hallmark Hallmark's Dinotopia three part movie. That's and a thing. That is a thing. <laughs> and I don't know if you ever heard of the Dinotopia books. No. No. Uh, yeah. It is essentially like um, what you got is a like you know society of like um, people who are like uh, who 
like live with dinosaurs in a utopian society and there are many books released on it and then hallmark picked it up for like a three-part movie project and it's pretty it's pretty ambitious but it is the most boring thing ever and the only re way i can get through it is if i'm doing something else while watching it <laughs> but i love it because i can just throw Throw it on and it's good background noise for me. <laughs> the CGI. Think... Huh? I'm oh, sorry. CGI, Go ahead. I assume the CGI is really bad. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, it's terrible. It's very terrible. You should go check it out because, like I said, it's on for, for free on um, YouTube. But like you know, you only need like maybe a good minute to know what to know what it's all about. The story is is that kind of like, and you you got one of the brothers from Prison Break starring in this thing. Wait, what? Yeah, you do. With um, I can't I can't remember. It's the one with the stronger jaw. Um, I can't remember those actors' names, but um, you got one of them in there starring. <laughs> he's just the he's just the biggest sort of like wimp in, throughout the whole thing and then you you got this other kid who's like the knockoff disney character uh, knockoff like disney's upcoming star celebrity looks handsome sort of dude sort of dude also co-starring in it as his brother they look nothing alike um <laughs> in, in a lot of these in a lot of these uh made for tv uh films and shows you have siblings that look nothing alike no yeah and like i said it's a hallmark movie so what uh what else did you expect and like it's three dang hours it's three hours and one of the first things you discover is that like Dinotopia doesn't believe in having weapons, and I'm like, you're telling me there's gonna be no fighting in this film. You got a bunch of dinosaurs, and there's gonna be no dang fighting. <laughs> that that just sounds ridiculous. Oh, oh my! I you know I don't know why I like it so much. <laughs> Maybe it's because it's like the most ambitious flop I've ever seen. I just like the concept of this thing and, and its existence. But if you would, the one thing I can say is good has nothing to do with the film is that like the book art, um, the author of the books does the art for the book for, for it all. And the art is amazing. And I think as a kid, that's what really got me into it as a whole whole is just that art is so good it's like oil painting stuff and all of that it just it looks fascinating and like me me being like into art art myself i'm i, I like really appreciate it so um it it obviously didn't translate to the movie too well yeah but, yeah you know yeah. hallmark they they tried their damnedest with like you know what hallmark can manage so I can, uh, I guess I can admire them taking on a very ambitious project. So yeah, you, you got that going for it. But you know, other than that, it's just there's really nothing to like genuinely enjoy. But I just, I, I just love the fact that it exists. <laughs> well, when I get the chance, I'll. Uh... Do, I'll look up both the uh, the books and also uh, check this out on YouTube when I get the chance. But um, I want to thank you for uh, being on the podcast. This was a lot of fun. No, it was. It, it was a lot of fun. I haven't well, I haven't really like talked to a lot a lot of people. I've been kind of out of, out of the loop with people since uh, ever since the whole COVID thing went down and and me kind of like distancing myself from social media so like this has been this was this was really fun to like talk with talk with some friends about like you know movie stuff and all that uh, i i i find it quite enjoyable i don't get to talk about this stuff too much yeah me 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 too that's why i created this podcast in the first place and i'd like to have you on again sometime no yeah that would be totally fun i'd be all down for that yeah, yeah. And I want to thank all of you out there for listening to yet another episode of my podcast, Podcast Racing. 
uh, please uh, comment down below your favorite guilty pleasure movie, show, whatever. And uh, again, thank you for listening. Hope you all are doing well out there, staying safe. And uh, yeah, see you guys next time. Bye.